Wednesday. Now, I had a few glitches last week, so I don't know why. So um, let me know if you can hear me, just to double check before we dive in. But today's lesson is very, very, very interesting to me. So I want you to go ahead and get your coffee and your tea and have a seat so we can do this half an hour together. It's called Confection, Confections, Confessions of an Ex-Coward, Peace be still. Hold on, let me check one more thing. You got one last chance to let me know. You can hear me. I think we're good. All right. All right. Now listen, it is still resurrection season. I know that resurrection Sunday happened a lot earlier than people were expecting this year, but I wanted you to I wanted we wanted to make sure that you kept this in mind that resurrection is not just a one and done thing. It's that day and it's over want you to look at it as a season because if you get the full benefits out of it, it'll become the power of a lifestyle. And so last Wednesday, we started talking about one of the things that was left behind that we were given because of the sacrifice of Christ, and that is peace. Another thing that the apostle brought out on Sunday that was left behind that we were given because of the sacrifice of Christ, and that is the Holy Spirit right? And in that is more peace. And so tonight, I just want to go a little bit deeper about this peace. And we're going to look at one particular moment and I want to walk through something. So to uh, make sure you know where you are, and then we're going to dive into this, uh, confessions of an ex coward. We're going to deal with peace. Be still. It's a tough word, but it's in the word. And let's see if we can get it into us. But first I want to make sure you know where you are. Okay, so go to Mark 4 and 35, right? I want to look at this. Uh, it says, that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. So let me set it up. Jesus had been teaching. And whenever you read the first part of the chapter, it just goes to all the different, not all, but a lot of the different lessons that t Jesus taught that day, taught to the multitude, taught to the people. All the teaching was done um, through parables, but it says at the end of that, that everything that he taught the public was taught through parables. But when he got along with the disciples, he explained everything to them. Okay. So then I want you to know that now I want to look at this because what happens is that when we are operating at our best, God uses his men and women of God. He uses his pastors to explain everything to the people. So there's something interesting in this word that touched my heart and I want to walk through it and see if it touches your heart. Okay. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. The teaching is done. He takes the disciples. Let's go over to the other side. Verse 36, leaving the crowd behind, they took him alone just as he was in the boat. So the disciples get on the boat. Hello. I see you. The disciples got on the boat with Jesus and they rode away from the crowd to the other side. There were also other boats with him. Okay. So it wasn't just one little lonely boat floating over to the other side. It was multiple boats. It was the entourage, you know what I mean? That, that was rolling, uh, with Christ, you know, uh, uh, him, the disciples, everyone that was rolling with him. Right. So it lets you, it sets you up for something when you are doing what God is calling you to do it will begin to attract the crowd. You'll have to know who is the crowd that you need to speak to in parables, who are the disciples that are up close that you need to explain it to. You need to know who are the ones you need to move away from and go to the other side and recover. Okay. So it's just so much in this word, right? So much in this word. Verse 30, for, uh, Mark 4 and 37, a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. So it means that, that it just began to storm and it was so thick that the waves were so high that they they were, you know, breaking over the boat and it almost overwhelmed the boat. It means the storm was strong enough to capsize the boat. The storm was strong enough to make the disciples believe that their lives were in danger. OK, so that's how serious it is. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? So I want to make sure that we get this. Jesus has just spent the day 
teaching the word of faith. And then when it was time, he pulled the ones closest to him. They got on the boat and they went away entourages of boats. They went away to the other side. So they just spent the day being exposed to faith. Then a storm came up and the storm makes sense to me because when storms come up right in my nature, it makes me nervous, right? So when the storm comes up, they are dealing with the storm. They are worried about the storm. They're trying to make sure all the ships are okay. And the disciples do not understand why Jesus is asleep. So whenever they come to Jesus, it's not just wake up. It's don't you even care if we drown. I want you to see that because what happens with us is that all of us have these preconceived notions, these thoughts in the back of our head, whether we say them out loud and we bring those thoughts to the people, those attitudes, this swag, right? So to speak to the people that we are talking to, even when we try to suppress it. So the attitude that the disciples had was we over here about to drown and you sleep. Don't you even care? I want you to remember that because when Jesus's um, attitude shows back up, I want you to understand that There was something going on in the first place with the disciples. And what I love about God is he has a way of getting to the heart of what's really going on with us. Right. Whether we like the language, the words, the way it was said or not. Okay, look at this. Look at this. So now we're at Mark 4, 39 and 40. Remember, the disciples said, woke him up and said, teacher, don't you care if we drown? When he gets up, he rebukes the wind and says to the waves, quiet be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. Then he says to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Here's the setup. So I'm Pastor Jay with Faith by Here in Christian Center Church in the beautiful city of Noonan, Georgia. And we are a church that has always taught faith and we still teach faith. But I have heard several things over the years. After a while, when someone has been sitting under that word for a while, there's a set of people that start to say, you know, I've outgrown this word of faith. You always teach faith. We're faith by hearing. So we're going to always teach faith. But there's something that you need to understand. Hebrews tells us without faith, it is impossible to please God, to make God happy, right? We also see when we walk through the word that without faith, we cannot live the best version of our lives that God designed for us. We also learn that faith is the thing that pulls down the promises of God, right? from the spiritual realm, from the new supernatural into the natural, right? Faith is an everyday tool, an everyday weapon, an everyday shield for the believer. But when you are in a battle and someone is coming for you, are you protected if you put your weapon down? Right. Like you've got to have your hand on the thing that protects you. So what happens with faith is you are as strong as the word is in you in that moment. Your life is not protected by the faith of your grandma. Right. Forever or the faith of your mom. There comes a point where your life is shaped, guarded, guided and protected by the faith that is active in you. Right. And this is what's so important. You can look at people who are new to the faith and they have small faith because they're just beginning. So we're talking to you, but we're also talking to the people who have been in the faith for a while and you haven't received everything that you have been faithing for. You haven't yet received everything that you have been praying for. You have some victories, but you don't have all of the victories. And I want you to pay attention because the enemy will use that to frustrate you. Your own energy, spirit, attitude will, will, you'll let it turn against you and you will get frustrated. And the frustration sometimes is used to draw you away from one of your most powerful weapons, which is your faith. Okay, so we're going back in this again. I want you to see this. They spent the whole day in the presence of a word of faith. You know how it is when you go to church and it feels good and that word was good. Then they walked outside the church and encountered a storm and none of the faith that they had received that day had sunk in. So they didn't have the ability to deal with the storm. Not only did they they had it, but they didn't grab a hold of it. So they not only did they not walk in the ability to deal with the storm, they judged Jesus 
for resting in the middle of the storm. Here's my first prayer. Father God, help us to use every moment of judgment as a trigger to draw us back closer to what you think is most important in that moment. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. Let me tell you why I prayed that prayer. We will slip into judgment. It is human nature, but your spiritual nature is designed to call you back. God, should I be judging that? Should I be focused on that? What is the position I should have in this moment right now? Now, when judgment comes up, use it as a self check. When I, when you start judging someone else, hold the mirror up and father, do I do those things? Help me to be victorious in that area. Father, am I focused on the right thing? Help me to put my mind on the thing that you, that will give me the greatest blessing, the greatest benefit according to your will and your word. Use that judgy spirit to shift your focus. Okay. Now here's why, because if you can be distracted and remain distracted, it becomes easy to frustrate your faith. All right. This is the confessions of an ex coward. I want to show you why, because we got to see in the word. But one of the ways that you, we become cowards is we lose our focus and we stop focusing on what we should really focus on. I'm focused on the storm instead of the victory I was promised in the storm before it ever came up. Look, I understand. You know what I'm saying? I'm human out in this piece, right? It's very easy when, when you don't get what you want, when people don't act the way that you want them to act. If your money is funny, if your friends are funny, if your maid is funny, if your kids are funny, it's very easy for your faith to become funny. However, God is bigger than your money, your man, your children, your dreams, your problems, your drama, all of it. And so when we understand who we are, we get to call our faith back into check. Build, build our faith back up and double back down on the promises God gave us. Now, how do you do that? You have to keep reading the word, right? You have to find and study the word that relates to your situation. And it's an ongoing thing, right? I was talking to a lady who was, she's Hannah, except she has one child. She wants another and she's a woman of faith. And whenever she heard that, about doubling down on her face. She's like, I don't, I don't want it. I don't want it. Want the blessing, but we don't want to do the work. And I understood her because I, I've done the same thing. I don't want to hold the ground anymore. I don't want to be strong while everyone else can be wild and crazy and weak. I don't want this. I don't want that. These are my words, right? Except for one thing. These are confessions right before God. And whenever I finish, I shut up right? And let him deal with all of that. Because sometimes it's just the fear that you won't actually receive what you've been believing for. It's the fear that you won't actually end up with the life that you've been dreaming of. It's the fear that you've already received the best that you could possibly receive. The money isn't as bad anymore. Maybe he won't fix the mate. You see what I'm saying? Or fix me, whatever it is, that fear is designed to frustrate your faith. Okay, we understand the secret weapon that perfect love casts out fear, but we can never underestimate the power of faith. You must continue to build your faith up. Otherwise, you will be at the threshold of your breakthroughs, walking away from a victory that is right around the corner. Right. So we build our faith up with this word. Look at this. This is the reason why we don't just talk. We also look at the root of the word, because if I know that it is something that is acknowledged in the word of God, that it was a blessing that was given in the word of God, that's Bible. So that means I've got a right to confess it in my ask for it in my own life, believe for it in my own mind, confess it out of my own mouth and begin to take actions to demonstrate I believe what I ask Ask for believe I believe what I'm saying in my mind I believe what I'm saying out of my mouth I got a right to because the word says God is no respecter of persons so if he will if they can be in a storm and he Jesus can rest in the storm then I can become the kind of person that can rest in the storm if Jesus can talk to a storm and a storm obey his voice then I can become the kind of person that a storm will obey my voice if Jesus can deal with my the disciples judgmental spirit then he can deal with my judgmental spirit so that I am not frustrated confused or distracted by my opinions about what other believers are doing because that's what they were doing 
The disciples were sitting there looking at the storm, looking at Jesus sleep, and they were distracted by their opinion about what this man was doing. Okay. We don't have time for that. What we have time for is I want to be focused on what you say is most important in this moment in this season, right? My peace is tied to my ability, right? To focus on what God considers to be the most important. But look, don't take my word. Look at it. Take the word of God. Mark 4, 39 and 40. Uh, he says, uh, he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? But we got to go back to this. You need to acknowledge that when Jesus got up, he spoke to three things. He woke up and the first thing he did was he spoke to the wind, which is the thing that was causing everything to be extra. He spoke to the root of the problem, spoke to the wind. You be quiet. Then he turned around and he spoke to the water. And the reason that's a big deal is that the water was reacting to what the wind was doing. So because of the way the wind was blowing, right, then the water began to become big to overwhelm. So he spoke to the first immediate thing that was reacting to the wind. And then, and he said to that, uh, be still, right? So he told the wind, you be quiet, quit talking. And then he told the water, you be still, quit reacting to what the wind is doing. And then he turned around and he spoke to the heart, the spirit and the soul of his disciples. And he asked them literally, why are you so afraid? He literally gave them the assignment of doing a self-check. Now, why are you so afraid? That the part that wasn't said, they spent the whole day in the presence of faith, in the presence of miracles. Now, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? So then he spoke to the people who were reacting to the waves and he spoke to the waves who were reacting to the wind. I want you to see something. Sometimes we go through things and the thing that we think is the main problem is not the root of the problem. Sometimes the people are sitting there looking at the waves, but the problem is really the wind. This is my prayer for us, Father, that we had developed the spiritual vision to see the root of the problem, to speak to the root of the problem, to speak to the reaction of the problem, and then to remember that we are people of faith and the power that, that you've given us to walk in. In Jesus' name, I pray for the ability to see the root and speak to the root, to see the reaction and speak to the reaction, and and to still operate in faith in the middle of any storm that comes our way. In Jesus name. Amen. I want you to look at this. Now let's stay with Mark 4 39, but I want to look at it through the Amplified. It says, all right, aren't you, aren't you, what did they say? Teacher, don't you even care if we drown? Now look at verse 39 in the Amplified. And he arose and rebuked the wind, spoke to the wind first. And then he said to the sea, you be still be muzzled. And then the wind ceased in the amplifiers. It says it sank to rest as if exhausted by its beating. So it just lost all, it just lost all will to continue to act like that. Right? So whenever we're praying for your ability and my ability to speak to the wind, we want you to have the kind of power that when you speak, the problem that is coming at you loses the power, the will to desire, the desire to keep coming at you. That much power is in the voice of Christ. That much power is in the voice of the one who is operating by faith. Now you choose that much power is in my voice when I speak. So that when I speak to my problems, when I speak to the wind that is coming at me, I'll speak the word of faith and it will lose not only the power, but the desire and the energy to keep acting like that in Jesus name. Look at this. Look at this. It says, uh, and there was immediately, I pray for the power of immediately to be released in our lives so that when you speak immediately, you see a faith filled reaction, a natural reaction to your faith filled words and conversation. So immediately a great calm and the Amplified describes it as a perfect peacefulness. 
So when we talk about the aftermath of the resurrection and that the Holy Spirit was left for you and that peace was left for you, I just want you to see that all while Jesus was operating with the disciples those three years, he was, he was laying a foundation for peace the whole time. The reason why this is so uh, important is that it feels like torment when your peace gets shattered. Right. Because when your peace gets shattered, it can get in your mind. It gets in your body. It can be so bad that it's a physical reaction, that it physically makes you sick. Right. When your peace gets shattered, it will it will it will cause you to make decisions to create the life that you don't actually want. Right. When your peace gets shattered, shattered, you t you'll talk in a way to create the chaos that you don't want to actually live in to to. It, you know, um, create the pain, create, you know what I'm saying? To steal your calm. So the reason why building up your faith and doing it for your entire lifetime is so important is when you understand who you are, right? And who you belong to and the power and the authority that was given to you and the power that is in the word of faith. Right. When you keep reminding and renewing and restoring your understanding of your faith walk, you will keep the weapon that will protect your peace. You will keep it sharp. Right. Because when it's time to cut something, a dull knife, right, steals too much energy and is not productive. But a sharp knife can cut the tip off the problem. Right. Can cut the pain out of the issue. So if I, so our faith has to be built up and stay built up and stay sharp. Right. So that we operate in the power we were given every single day. Everything is not. Um, you know, chaos to the point of destruction. Every bad situation, every problem, every storm is not big enough to capsize your ship if you are operating in the faith that God gave you. So then what happens with believers is that we have certain areas where we have high faith and then we have other areas where we have low faith and then we have other areas where we have no faith. So the reason why we keep building up the faith is we want to learn that in the areas of success, how to get the faith that we develop. Some of you have faith for God to show up for you in your job, but you don't have faith for God to show up for you in your marriage or you have faith for God to show up for you and your children. But you don't have faith for you see what I'm saying for you to show up um, in your other relationships. Right. When we build the faith up, you start realizing, you know what, God, I give you permission to go into every area of my life. I believe your word for my health. Now, I also believe your word for my money. I also believe your word for my dreams. I believe your word for my man, my mate, my wife, whatever you're standing for. I believe your word right for this physical storm, right? That's coming that used to scare me. I believe like Jesus, I can speak to the wind, speak to the waves and speak to myself, right? And have peace and rest even in the storm that you have the kind of faith that you can speak to the storm and it affects how the storm acts, right? That it'll take the power out of the storm. It'll take the power out of the fear that's trying to find a place in you, right? When you know what he gave you, then fear doesn't have the authority to control you. When you know what God gave you, then the storm doesn't have the authority to scare you. Right. When you know what God gave you, then the wind doesn't have the authority to drown you. This is why it's important. And this is why we keep getting built up. And the funny thing is about God is that we're not here all day. We're not together all day on Sunday. We're not together all night on Wednesday. But these words, they come in and they re-remind us of who they are. So I want to remind you of another technique. You need the power of repetition. This is why I do like the Bible studies, where you're able to let them play and let that become your background music. So instead of everything that you worry about when your family leaves your presence, let the word of faith become your background music. So much so if we do that, it will begin to get into us and change the way we think. 
I'm doubling back down, recollecting, rewriting my scriptures on faith, re-renewing my spirit about what God says he will do in my city, in my family, in my heart, in my life. You see what I'm saying? I'm redoubling down. I'm reconfessing things that I have lost um, my faith for. I'm reconfessing. You know, Father, I still believe that. I stand in that. I'm recollecting the stories, re-reminding myself that there are generals in the faith in the Bible that we praise, right? But, but you're talking about 10, 20, 30, 50, 100, 200 years of sometimes walking out a word, right? And I'm recommitting myself to walk out your word because I believe that if I stand in a place of faith, it won't take 200 years. But if you give up, you can guarantee the outcome, right? That's what's so crazy about that. The giving up doesn't get you where you want to be, right? It's a fake vindication, right? The standing in faith builds you up and it creates the peace. Remember, even when the storm was raging, Jesus still had two things in the middle of the storm before he ever talked to it. He had rest and he had peace. So if I can keep my faith even in the middle of the storm, I can have rest and I can have peace. Then from a place of rest and peace, he took up the power to speak and put everything in its place. That's your spiritual right. Take it on. I want you to see this. Look at this. Um, in the Amplified, Jesus says, why are you so timid and fearful? How is it that you have no faith, no firm, relying trust? Basically, you've been walking with me all day. You've been walking with me all this time, right? Storm came up. You can't do nothing yet. Okay, look at this. I want you to see it in New King James. He said, then he arose and rebuked the wind, said to the sea, peace be still, right? He's telling peace. He, he, he lays peace on the wind and on the, the waves as if it was a blanket, right? And so it has to be still and the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said to them, why are you so fearful? So in the Amplified, it calls them timid, right? And in the NIV, it says afraid. And in the New King James, it says fearful. But every version says, you don't have no faith. Don't you have any faith? Where is your faith? Look at this. I want you to see it in the message Bible. This is my Nana's favorite Bible. Mark 4, 39 through 40. Awake now. Jesus is up now because they've woken him up. They done talked a little smack to him, right? And he's up now. And he told the wind, pipe down, said to the sea, quiet, settle down. And the wind ran out of breath, right? So may your enemies lose the breath to curse your name, to run you down when you speak the word of faith. May your enemies begin to either be silent or begin to speak life about you, right? Do you send the word? Look at this. The sea became smooth as glass. So the sea was acting like this before. All that. That's too much. And it became all smooth as glass. Just because Jesus spoke the word of faith. So I pray that for you. That, you, that when you speak to the problems, they become like smooth as glass. Speak to yourself, right? I speak to yourself. Peace be still in my heart. Peace be still in my head. Peace be still in my body. Peace be still in my mind. May you become as smooth as glass as you speak the word of faith over, you, over yourself, over your life. Look at this. This is what Jesus says uh, in, the, in, the, in the message Bible. It says, why are you such cowards? Don't you have any faith? Okay, so when we hear, a, when people say, when people that we love and trust say things to us that we don't want to hear, they give us a hard word, you've got the option to reject that word or you've got the option to calm down and really listen to what they said. Father, I do this. Father, why would he say that to me? Father, why would she say that to me? I go back in prayer. Right. Because they could be right. Remember Jahari's window, there's a fourth quadrant in you that you can't see the part of you that you can't see that other people can see. And then there's a part of you that you can't see and no one can see for that. For the one you need, you need God. And for the other, you need trusted others to begin to expose you, right? Because I don't want some weak area to control and run and limit my life. I want to know the truth so that the 
faith word of God can guide my life and shape the quality of my life. So now look at this. Why are you such cowards? That becomes a word. Right. That becomes a word for some mirror talk to look in the mirror and ask and ask, why am I such a coward? Right. That becomes a prayer. Father, in what areas of my life am I afraid when I should not be? When am I fearful? In what area of my life am I a coward? Expose it to me, Father. In Jesus name, I pray. Amen. It's a tough word. Don't nobody want to be called a coward. But since it's Jesus talking, then I want to hear why it's on the table. And then I want a God given plan to eradicate it so that my boldness is not fake. Right. So that my swag of confidence is not like a dress or a pair of pants that I put on. It is actually something that comes up out of me because the love of Christ and the faith in the word is just that strong. Father, expose to us any area where we are cowards and then eradicate that. Fear, that timidity, that lack of boldness, that cowardness out of us so that we can look like Jesus look in the middle of any storm, able to see the root of the problem and speak to it, able to see the reaction of the problem and speak to it and able to deal with the people who are judging us and deal with them focused on what you would have us focused on and not us. Th let me say this another way. There's a set of you that would have got up and said, I know you didn't come at me like that. Who you think you talking to? That is not what Jesus did, right? He did not speak to their attitude. There's a lot of people around you who are walking around with attitudes because they are afraid. Jesus did not speak to their attitude. In the disciples, he did the same thing with the disciples that he did with the storm. He spoke to the root of the problem first. He spoke to the wind first. Then he dealt with the reaction, the waves. When he spoke to the disciples, he spoke to the fear first. That's the root of the problem. And then he gave them the thing. If you have faith, you would react to this differently. You see what I'm saying? So then this is the ability that's, that's available to you, that when we are dealing with the people around us, that we speak to the root of the problem like Jesus did in this situation, that we speak to the root of the problem first and that we speak to the reaction of the problem second, right? But there was no point that he was caught up in, I like your nerve, I like your tone, I know you didn't come for me like this, Jesus ain't in the street fighting. You know what I'm saying? He ain't in the boardroom manipulating. Right. He's speaking to the heart of the moment, the heart of the men. Right. The heart of the entire situation. Why? When you can get to the root. Right. Then you can get to real healing. When you can get to the heart of it, you can root out real fear and leave the people with real power. There's a lot to this. I want you to see this last thing in Mark 4 and 41. After Jesus spoke to the storm and spoke to them the way he did, they were terrified. It says in verse 41, Mark 4 and 41, they were terrified, right? Now they're scared again before they were scared of the storm. But then Jesus, the power that worked in Jesus was so strong that they were, they, they now was like scared of Jesus, like and they asked each other, who is this? Right. Even the wind and the waves obey him. OK, they've been walking with Jesus. They thought they knew who Jesus was. But because of the way Jesus reacted to problems, it made the disciples rethink. I don't I thought the wind and the waves was the baddest thing in this moment. I just discovered that Jesus is bigger and badder than the storm. Oh, my God. What am I dealing with? Now, I want you to see you in this, you in this, okay? Because what happened was Jesus says in John 14, 15 and 16, he starts talking about the vine, setting you up for the fact that he, setting the disciples up for the fact that he's going to leave, but that because I leave, I am leaving you the works that I did and greater works, right? Because I go to my father, okay? So then I want you to see that you in this, because this is what's in you. When people are jocking you, when they are chasing after you, when they crave your attention, when they want to be near you and like you, what has happened is there's something in you that has shown up that is bigger than the situation around them. And they're watching you deal with the situation from a place of power that the average person doesn't operate in. 
right? And your presence excites them, makes them curious, and also makes them nervous. There are some people who pick at you, who come for you because they are afraid of what you're operating in. They don't understand what you're operating in. I want you to understand that this power that Jesus operated in, that's available to you. I want you to understand that when you are a person of faith, sometimes you slip into that power without understanding fully. But when you don't understand fully, you will slip out of the power and not have command of it when you should. Right. So when you recognize that the power that worked in Christ is available to me, God made it available. So whenever I talk to God in the name of Jesus, this is the authority I have when I keep my not just prayer. Because most Christians pray, but most do not read the word. So if the time between when you read the word and when you prayed, if that time gets too big, then the power of your prayers will get weaker because eventually you'll stop praying the word, right? Or you'll stop praying a fresh word and you'll just start praying your feelings, your worry, your doubts, your emotions. Right. And that's one type of prayer. But whenever you pray the word of God, there's a power in it. That's where the power to stop the storm comes from. That's where the power to calm your own spirit with the word of God comes from. OK, so we're praying the word. You can't pray a word that you won't read. And it is not enough that you read the word in 2005. You need to read it again. What's today in 2024? Right. You need a fresh renewing of that word so that your faith stays sharp and able to work for you and able to show up for you. Right. So what will happen is if we you will operate in everything in this, just I'm not even gonna say everything, just operate in what was given to you in Mark 35 all the way through 41, then you'll be somewhere and, you know, people will be like, who is she? Who is he? Simply because you operate in faith and they don't understand why you haven't quit already. Who is she? Right. They don't understand why you haven't given up already. Who is he? They don't understand why you didn't curse God and die already. Who is she? They don't understand why you actually think you're smart, even though they put a lot of work in to convince you of the lie that you're stupid. They're going to be like, who is she? Right. When they say, who does he think he is? Right. When you are operating in faith, baby, that's on God. Right. You just acting like your bro you just acting like the son of God. You acting like Jesus. You operating in the authority that was given you just because the boogeyman is here. Don't mean he can run my life just because the storm comes. Don't mean he can it can wreck my house just because you talk and smack about me. Don't mean you can steal my distract that you can distract me from the main thing. Who is he? Who is she? Who is this? That question should be on the table, but it won't be. If you don't double back down and operate in faith, right? Because the thing about faith is you could have operated in faith in all these years, give up now. And you got people that'd be like, yeah, I didn't think she could do it. No, leave them. They gonna talk about you anyway. Remember the disciples was talking about Jesus when he was asleep. And then they were still talking about him when he got up. So when they talk about you, when you get up, Leave them with a word that matters. Leave them with a word that will make a difference. Operate in the things of God and leave them curious about that power, right? All them cuss words, they make us feel good when we be slaying them words, but they ain't got no power in it. They don't do nothing. You just wear your little energy out and you haven't caused heaven to move on your behalf and you haven't caused the people around you to grow. You might have backed them up for a few seconds, but we want some deep work. Right. We want the storm stopped at the root. Right. We, we want instead of them being like, you don't care if we live or die. We want them trying to figure out who the heck you are, because if they got to figure out who you are, then they got to figure out the power that you operate in. And when they got to figure out the power that you operate in, they're going to bump up to God. They're going to bump right up to God and what God gave them. All right. All right. You be this. Be the person that even the wind and the waves obey. You've got a right to it because Jesus is it. And he said it out of his mouth that greater works than these shall you do because I go to my father. So be the kind of person. Father, father, help us to be the kind of people that when we speak to the wind and the waves, they obey us in the name of Jesus Christ. Help us to operate like Jesus in this earth in every area of our lives. That's my time. 
and I thank you for yours. Yes, we want that peace. Well, it's tied to your faith. All right, I'm fighting for mine. So this is not the confessions. We are not out here confessing like cowards and timid. This is the confessions of an ex Coward, we are putting that down, which means in order to do that, you picking up your faith. In order to pick up your faith, you got to get back up in this word and read it, baby, and get your and stay full because you got work to do, right? And there's a there are people who are looking over at you, looking down at you, looking up to you, right? And in all those situations, if you're operating what God gave you, He will use your life to create change that matters for them. All right, all right, that's my time. All right. All right. So I'm excited because I like what God is doing and we're, my will is set to be in the flow with him. Right. And so I'm praying the same thing for you, because when he calls a man or a woman, he assigns people to support that vision. So we've got things to do. But that being said, I am glad that you had a chance to hear the word. And I pray that it was a blessing to you. And if it was, I want you to go ahead and prepare your heart and sow your seed and be deliberate about this moment. Right. And just want to remind you of two things. Be a farmer. You are giving and you are expecting a return in your life. The return you want is the best and everything you need to fulfill the assignment that you have been called to. And you are also given so that there are resources in the house of God so that we can teach the word, so that we can expand the ministry, so that we can uh, do the work that God has called us to do and respond to our community whenever they need help. All of it. But make no mistake, it's crazy out here. Right. So we do need the light to stay alive and active. Right. A place that stays in the God somewhere where our people can go and get the help, the renewing, the reminder that they need. So we can go back out there with the strength that was made available to us. We human. So you got to get refilled up. All right. So it's on the screen, the different ways to give. If you're multitasking, let me tell you, you can go to faithbyhearinglive.org. Hit the button that says support the vision and you can give that way. We're also on Cash App and you put dollar sign faith by hearing in front of that. All right. I am glad for you to be here in the middle of resurrection season. We have a word for you on Sunday, so I will see you and I'm excited. And I want to remind you that our fast begins uh, Monday morning. You guys like a warning, so begin to get ready. But we're going to get into this on Sunday and make sure we understand some more of what was left for us after resurrection season so that we're ready to fast and we're in a position of power, right? Because it's time, honey, it's time to put down some stuff, right? It's time to run away from some things that have been running and controlling you. It's time to let go. It's time to quit looking at what everyone else is doing, right? There's some things that, you know what I mean, that's happening in, in each of us individually. God deals with that first. And when he can deal with that, it breaks up the floodgates. But let me stop. Let's get out of here. It's beautiful. You have heard the word. We had our minutes together and I'll let's go. Oh, hey, how you doing, Kiara? Good night. Hi, Miss Charlie. Thank you. How you doing, Miss Shirley? I think you were the first one in here. Amen. Hey, Miss Evelyn. Hi, Miss Leah. Good to see you. Hi, Mr. Beaver. It's good to see you. Hi, Mr. Peterson. He's going to be coming on, uh, joining us. I love when our teachers are in here. Uh, to participate. All right, you guys, let's get out of here and let's go live what we learned. All right. And I'm gonna, yeah, get out of here like I know what I'm doing. Okay. Bye y'all. <laughs>